good morning. Well, it's my good morning. I got up super early, went and got in the Atlantic Ocean. Fucking cold, like seriously cold. So I'm a little dopey right now because my body has taken some time to warm up again and the uh, shivering has kind of worn me out a bit. But um, I will do my best. So we're heading into part three of my letter to the inside. And, you know, it's been honestly quite emotional reading this. Um, and also strange because, you know, this was my mindset back in uh, March 2018. I mean, I wrote this thing, you know, in, in February and March. And I was less than a year out, so I was still unraveling a lot of things. And I mean, some of the stuff I read, I just cringe, you know. But that's the nature of, you know, being in a coercive environment like that and, you know, honestly just being brainwashed and, and waking up bit by bit. I also find myself wanting to comment on so many things and there's just, there's just so much to unpack. But perhaps as, as time goes on and I know people will be asking questions, I can unpack things more and more. Um, okay, part three. This is entitled Nancy Salzman. Back to Nancy Salzman. Nancy, in a kind of religious fervor, will beat you emotionally and tell you it was love and caring. Many of you have expressed how hard this has been for you. Even you, Lauren. Below are excerpts from a letter I wrote to Nancy Salzman on January 5th, 2016. Now remember, I left in May 2017. Dear Nancy, I want to talk about what I perceive as your cruel behavior towards certain people at certain times. I'm not sure what goes on for you, but sometimes, suddenly, when it's least expected, you will lash out at someone in anger. They are left reeling and confused. I myself have been the recipient of that. For me, the most recent time was in Fiji at the airport, when you began yelling at me, calling me a bad protector, and took a reactive stab at my leadership role in SOP. The woman around you tried to calm you down and assure you everything was fine, which indeed it was. As quickly as you yelled at me, in front of everyone and the entire check-in area were within earshot, it was over. I was left seething. You were escorted away by those handling you. I don't know what spurs this, but it seems like you go into some kind of attack mode. I've seen it in numerous intensives and conversations over the years. It's as if you assume some kind of intent of the person and behave very cruelly towards them with very little regard to the consequences on their psychology or on those watching. Then there's the way you speak about people behind their backs. Once I had to instruct the video department to remove unkind comments you made about other people that were recorded so no one else would ever hear them. I have spent an inordinate amount of effort trying to protect these things from being seen by others. It came to a head in Jeunesse 7 when the men chose you as an example of a woman that speaks dishonorably. I defended your authority as the head of the training, saying I did not think it was appropriate in that setting and it would undermine your position. They conceded, but insisted I have a private conversation with you about it. Well, it's taken me this long. Over the years, a few people who have witnessed these aggressive, dishonorable, or gossipy behaviors have come to me asking if I see them. Recently, two people in a training asked me about the way they perceived you attacked someone who asked a question from the audience. I feigned ignorance, but they insisted. Did you really not see it, they asked. I nodded quietly. I'll work on it, I answered. There are four specific examples I can think of over the years I could share with you if you want. Now, why is this important? We all have our moments, right? We're all impulsive. You have the unique position of being the conscience of the company. We grew up in ESP watching your videos. You dug into our deep structure and helped us reorganize our morality and refine our ethics. We have a unique bond with you as the spokesperson of this model. You and what we have learned are inside of us. So it's truly confusing when you lash out at someone in a fit of impulsivity. More importantly, it affects their thought object of goodness. It kind of fucks them up. Especially if after you get upset at them, you explain it away as being something you're doing for their own good. I don't think it's good. There's a movie I saw a few weeks ago called Spotlight. It's absolutely brilliant. Everyone should see it. It showed me a process that helped me understand why this is so important. Very different content, but the process was fascinating. Some journalists are trying to reveal some indiscretions on the part of the Catholic Church. 
the church and many other people were trying to cover up the act, saying, yes, but look at all the good the church does. The journalists just wanted to get to the truth. There's a devastating thing that happens when one of the journalists, who was a devout Catholic, realizes that this has broken something inside of him. That although the church is trying to do good things, hiding this thing has made him doubt goodness itself. That was the saddest thing for me, and then I realized, that's how I feel about this. I think it's important and imperative that you get under the fear of what's causing this. I think it's imperative because it's causing damage in the company and it's causing damage to psyches. There are a number of people that see this and I think they're at their wit's end as to what to do about it. I think they're afraid of how you might react. I felt it important to bring to your attention. With love and respect, Mark. You know, in, in, in listening to this, in, in reading this, it, it was kind of terrifying for me because, you know, you're basically giving feedback to the CEO of the company. And, you know, in the ranking system, you know, I was sort of somewhere in the middle in their entire ranking system. So it was, you know, basically going to the CEO, CEO and saying, listen, there are some problems and this is what's going on. I remember being pretty terrified. Next section is called the mantra. Many of you know this aspect of Nancy Salzman. Maybe you've been on the receiving end of it when she lost her shit on you or someone else. You, Lauren, have cried about it. This letter below, I wrote to Nancy Salzman in August 2017. It was after I heard that she was going around saying I was the mastermind behind the blow-up and that a mantra I gave her in SOP Complete was in fact reflective of my true Machiavellian nature. In the end, I never sent the letter, but it's worth reading. Dear Nancy, I keep hearing you speak with dishonor about me, referencing projective frames with respect to a mantra I gave you in SOP Complete. You have suggested to numerous people the mantra I gave you were my true feelings and actual intent. Not true. I think it's good for you to know your particular mantra's design came from your mentor, Keith Ranieri. I actually softened it because I was uncomfortable with how cruel I believed his suggested mantra was for you. Perhaps you should analyze his projective frames. I've told you before, I believe you have been treated with great cruelty. You couldn't even take it in. Perhaps because you yourself have come to believe, if you acknowledge abuse, you may be demonized as the abuser and further punished. Well, let me say it on your behalf. I believe you have been abused in ways you cannot even allow yourself to imagine. You will, of course, show him this message so he can point out issues and devise some projective Machiavellian word salad about me being the spawn of Satan or some similar intellectual hogwash. Soon you will be convinced this message you're reading is some decades-long planned nefarious plot meant to harm or destroy you. That is simply not so. I just thought you deserved to know who is pulling the strings behind the curtain, not me. I am one of the few that actually try to help you see the trap you're in. All things aside, I do wish you a happy Thanksgiving, and I hope you are well. And that, as I said, that letter I never sent, and that was August 2017, which was two months before the New York Times broke the article. Next section, permanent state of terror. Nancy, you are in a permanent state of terror. Do you know why you fall asleep in every single meeting with your Lord and Master? It's not because you're disintegrated. I think it's because you're trying to unconsciously check out from the horror. What was the terrible breach slash sin you believe you've committed that makes you terrified for your salvation? What has made you offer up young things to be abused? Speaking of offering up young things, why is it generally frowned upon in the outside world for the CEO of a company to fuck most of their staff? You may have heard this creates problems and can occur due to an abuse of authority. Unfortunately, the person holding the purse strings or the promotion strings or the authority strings can sometimes end up fucking girls too afraid to say no. Sort of like what happens in some churches and human potential movements. Why is it acceptable for the leader of a philosophical movement to fuck dozens of staff members and subordinates? Why is there a rabid quest to hold everybody else in the organization accountable, yet your lord and master has zero accountability and is held to no standard? Why do so many of you not admit the man you were talking about in your sourcings is Keith Ranieri? 
why do you not openly admit you're having sex with him or in love with him or fixing a breach so you can have the avatar baby or the enlightened relationship or whatever else has been dangled in front of you? Do you think it's because society is too disintegrated to understand the profundities of this way of life? Or is it because if you said it aloud, it would sound fucking abusive and kooky? I'm going to go with abusive and kooky. And FYI, giving in and having sex with him because you were told it will heal the previous sexual abuse in your life is plain fucked up. That is perverse, abusive, mystical bullshit. The next section is called Mark Vicente's wife is a horrible abuser. Let's discuss Jeunesse 10. Now, Jeunesse tracks were the, was the, the Jeunesse curriculum, which was the woman's curriculum, which was turned into an intensive. And the Jeunesse tracks the, the men and women would, would attend. And the idea, supposedly, was to, to try to teach men uh, what, the, what the female perspective was. But honestly, as it went on, it just seemed more and more uh, denigrating and abusive towards women. So after a while, I think around about Jeunesse 5, some of us were like, what is going on here? It's just really cruel. Anyway, I continue. Let's discuss Jeunesse 10. By the way, has anybody really sat down and mulled through the issues with a man designing a woman's movement? I renamed Jeunesse 10 the Let's Convince Mark Vicente That His Wife Is a Horrible, Malevolent Abuser Intensive. The idea of the intensive was anyone who thinks they've been abused is actually the abuser. Let's try upscale this in process terms to a radical metaphor. Let's say a woman escaped from Dachau or Auschwitz. Unlikely, but humor me. She stumbles into the forest into the hands of the resistance. She screams about what was done to her, the abuses, the torture, the rapes, the mind games, the breaking of her will. The resistance stare coldly at her and suggest that perhaps she should look at her projections. And is it possible she's the abuser and not the Nazi officers and soldiers? After all, she would not know their behavior unless she herself dot dot dot. I can't even finish the sentence. It's so bizarre. Because I'd been part of so many intensives designed to break Edgar Boone's will or try and flip his assumptions, I realized, oh, this might be an intensive design for me. I mentioned this suspicion to Keith Raniere, and he said, no, this was all old material from the early days of Jeunesse. Uh-huh. I checked with Nancy. He had just downloaded this material, brand new. You guys need to check your stories. Also, Lauren, D, U, O, you think this abuse is actually the abuser thing sounds perfectly reasonable, don't you? Okay. Then say it loud and proud on social media. Say it to the hundreds that die horrible, sometimes violent deaths every day at the hand of malevolent abusers. You gals need to get out more. Go to Africa. Go do relief work in war-torn countries. Then maybe come back and try that intellectual psychobabble. Now, just as a reminder, there are certain people's names that I'm just using initials for, for reasons of my own. Speaking of psychobabble, Lauren, remember during Jeunesse 10 when I asked you what the other secret stripe path was? You acted confused. What other stripe path, you said? The one with the weird vows and the diets and the secrets and the control. The one sucking the life out of the girls. Again, you acted confused. I mentioned to you all the girls are looking very, very unhealthy. Even you, I said. I'm worried about you. You don't look well. I'm great, you replied. No, you're not. You have terrible vertigo and are curled up in a ball in the proctor room sometimes. You moved into what I call automatic pilot mode and said I should have seen you before ESP. I'm better than I've ever been. It reminded me of the public mantra of some DOS woman, never been better. You've seen the video of Tom Cruise jumping on the couch, right? Not very convincing. Many, many people know you are not better than ever. You, Lauren, are a stressed mess who spends inordinate amounts of time curled up in bed sick. Don't let your Lord and Master convince you it's weakness. It's not. It's your conscience crying out for help. You know that baby you wanted to have? Just go have it with someone else. These last statements will likely seem an impossibility to the harem. Yes, the harem does exist. Why impossible? Because they think this is their only choice, 
and they've convinced themselves they are willing participants. You are willing participants only in so much as a woman in an abusive relationship is willing. They don't think they have a choice, and they think they deserve it. There is a better way to live. All you girls slash women don't have to live vying for your lord and master's attention. Albany is in a constant state of tension and gossip because members of the harem are jealous of each other and use the tech to punish each other. What if you didn't have to live like that? The next section is called Emotional Barrier. The reason most on the inside think they can never leave is because there is a mental emotional barrier in place. Because of the nature of the indoctrination, it's my belief you are strongly dissuaded from questioning leadership or speaking negatively about what you see. Your best values as a human, yearning for goodness and nobility, are connected to the leadership as though they are one and the same thing. After years of reinforcement, you might feel that to question the problems and inconsistencies you see would literally destroy your own code of morality, ethics, and nobility. So you don't go there. I see this especially in the men. They cannot question the leadership. It feels wrong, almost like some kind of sin. So they make constant excuses for what might be happening. It can't be the obvious thing right in front of you. There must be a more mysterious explanation. It's like the emperor's new clothing. You feel like questioning is bad, so you go along and ooh and ah about the emperor's new incredible remarkable clothing, which is not there. Deep inside you know, but it feels almost sinful to admit it. This is the wall of psychosis you will have to cross if you truly begin questioning. For some, there are other reasons for not leaving. A few are afraid of the material losses. Edgar, your trap was designed by Keith Raniere years ago. In the executive board meetings, he explained to us he used golden handcuffs with you. You would be trapped by how much money you were making and the recognition that if you left, you would lose it. I'm a believer. You stay in something because you want to, not because you have handcuffs on. Coercion is not so much my cup of tea. But seriously, my friend, you've been fucked over. The number of meetings that occurred about your so-called bad behavior and your book, the character assassination in the executive board, the argument between Lauren and I when I suggested the concepts in your book pre-existed Keith Raniere, she was very upset. All came from him. Eventually, I believe you acquiesced. Even though anyone who reads esoteric writings might find your material does indeed predate the 20th century. You are not treated well, and yet you stand by. So Edgar Boone was a, um, what was his rank? I think he was a counselor, emeritus. I think, as far as I know, um, Edgar is still um, loyal to Keith Raniere. I believe Edgar is a good man. And, you know, he's had a number of these sort of, I guess you could call them sort of spiritual breakthroughs, and he began writing these books, and he was told that basically he was stealing all of Keith Raniere's concepts, which I don't think was true. Um, and eventually what Keith Raniere did was basically convince Edgar that he would be the guru, and I believe Edgar acquiesced to that. So I find that to be a deeply sad story, and I hope that if Edgar is not let go of the organization and Keith Raniere, I hope that one day he does. All right, that's the end of part three. Part four will be coming next. We will talk soon.